Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda. And this episode, we're going to look at Pope St. Gregory the Great. Pope St. Gregory the Great is a name that is frequently included amongst the list of names of early church fathers who supposedly rejected the deuterocanon of the Old Testament, which Protestants call Apocrypha. And uh, we're going to take a look at this. Uh, as you know, constantly over the years, I've been continuing my research in the Deutero canon, reassessing old positions. Just recently, I've been updating and doing some fresh research on Gregory the Great. So it's a very interesting case, and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at questions of, did he reject the Deutero canon? Did he do so as Pope? So is there any kind of authoritative weight to his rejection of the Deuterocanon, is this an infallible decree that's in contradiction to the Council of Trent? We're going to look at um, how he used these writings elsewhere and why he did this, as well as assess the overall weight of appealing to uh, one of the doctors of the church, Gregory the Great. So we have a lot to tackle in this episode, so why don't we begin the Apocrypha Apocalypse. All right, so it's interesting. I received some emailed inquiries regarding Gregory the Great right when I was doing fresh research into the topic. And so that's why I want to address today. Take another fresh look at Pope St. Gregory the Great and what he had to say about the Deuterocanon in his works. And so let's start by talking a little bit about when Gregory the Great wrote. Gregory was born in 540, thereabouts. He died in 604. And of course, he's one of the teachers of the church, doctors of the church. Uh, he's a fantastic pope. And so in a way, I think non-Catholic apologists love to cite Gregory the Great as evidence against the Deuterocanon canon because of that fact. There is a, a factor of embarrassment. The same reason why they, they cite Cardinal Cajetan, Cardinal Zimenez, uh, the Glossia Ordinaria, these books. It's not because it has any relation to the question of whether or not the Deuterocanon or the so-called Apocrypha is inspired by God and therefore canonical. Instead, uh, it's way too late to really have any bearing on that issue. In fact, I think if Catholic apologists cited the very same people as affirming the Deutero canon, I can tell you as a fact that no Protestant would change their mind regarding these books. Why? Well, because it's really late in scripture. It's definitely outside what I would consider the red zone in patristic scholarship in terms of getting evidence about whether these books were handed on by Christ and the apostles to the church as inspired writings. It's just simply too late. But nevertheless, Gregory the Great and the others are important, not so much on that very important fundamental question of inspiration, but it's actually very helpful in assessing how it came to be that Protestants rejected these books as mere human writings. And so in a way, it tells us a lot more about early and medieval uh, scholarship and the things that led up to the Protestant Reformation, uh, but it tells us very, very little, practically no value in terms of the actual indication whether or not these things are inspired. So with that in mind, what is the evidence that's usually adduced in regards to Gregory rejecting the Deuterocanon? Well, there is only one reference, and that comes in his Moralia in Job in 1921-34 which says, quote, with reference to the particular, we are not acting irregularly. If from the books, though not canonical, yet brought out for the edification of the church, we bring forth testimony. Thus, Eleazar in the battle smote and brought down an elephant, but fell under the very beast he killed. And that's a reference to 1 Maccabees 6.46. The first thing to note is this is the only reference that can be quoted against the Deuterocanon from Gregory's works. 
which really says a lot if you understand how many works we have from Gregory. In fact, in the Ming, Patrologia Latinae, this is one of the four volumes that's dedicated to the works of Gregory the Great. And as you can see, this, these are pretty substantial volumes. So in all the works of Gregory the Great, we have these few lines of a qualification. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't exist or they're not important, but put in perspective, this certainly wasn't something that Gregory the Great was going to fall on a sword for. I think that certainly wasn't a point of emphasis in his study. In fact, if you look at this quotation, I think what you see is not so much a direct rejection, but an anticipation of a possible rejection. Because he says that if he brings forth this example from 1 Maccabees, it wouldn't be irregular because even if it's not considered canonical, it nevertheless can be still brought forward for edification. Now, these words about being not canonical and being brought forward for edification comes from St. Jerome. And as you know, St. Jerome, very important figure in terms of the development, confusion about the Old Testament canon, because he is the first early church writer to call these books apocrypha and absolutely reject them. And he did so because he believed that these were not authentic quotes, but it were spurious additions to the inspired Hebrew. And um, we have whole episodes where we go into Jerome's Hebrew verite, Hebrew truth, and the problems with that. But that being said, it's clear that Gregory the Great, perhaps reading the preface, because uh, it likely came from Jerome's preface to the books of Solomon, that he read the preface, saw Jerome's objection. And so when he came up to use this episode from 1 Maccabees, he cites this in anticipation that, well, maybe somebody wouldn't accept these as canonical, but nevertheless, we could still bring them forward for edification, just like Jerome says in his preface. So I don't think it's a rejection that is born of Gregory's own opinion or of church history but rather it's more an anticipation of a possible objection. In fact, positively, he does adduce this as evidence. So if he didn't believe it was canonical and could no way be entered into uh, debate or serve as proof or anything like that, he certainly wouldn't have even made mention of this book. Now, notice he only mentions in regards to 1 Maccabees. Now, of course, Jerome rejected the whole of the Deuterocanon, and so that will be important, too, because we're going to see how Gregory uses the other books of the Deuterocanon to find out what he really means. Okay, that being said, let's assume, let's assume that this is an, an outright explicit rejection of the Deuterocanon. Okay, what authoritative weight does this have for Catholics? Again, I think that's really where the strength of citing Gregory the Great is, is that embarrassment factor that somehow here we have a, a papal decree or an infallible statement in which the Pope explicitly rejects what later becomes a conciliar position at Council of Trent. Well, a lot has to do with the background. See, Gregory was a monk for quite some time before he became Pope. And in fact, the predecessor pope had sent Gregory as a monk to Constantinople to uh, try to broker an agreement with the emperor for protection of Rome, because this is during the declining period after the Roman Empire and its center really was moved to the east. Rome was in trouble, and it was uh, being invaded by barbarians. So he, as a monk in Constantinople, this is essentially where this work begins. So it's well before his time of Pope, and it begins with just simple lectures. And it was through a patron who arranged for secretaries to jot down notes from these lectures that eventually becomes the book that we have before you that contains that quote. Now, here I want to cite a recent biography of Gregory the Great that's recently been translated into English from German. And it is In the Eye of the Storm, a biography of Gregory the Great by Sigrid Grabner. 
2021. And it explains, quote, but very few people knew about these lectures and they did not appear in book form until after he was elected Pope. So there's a, a long period of composition where he's giving oral lectures, they're being written down, they're being collected, but as this points out, this wasn't published in book form. And in fact, very few people even knew about it until he was elected Pope, and then it was available in book form. So apparently, even though he may have done some editing and expansions in the book, nevertheless, it really wasn't done as part of his papacy. This was an ongoing project that he had. So it's hard to say that this is in any way a kind of papal document because it was already in circulation well before he became Pope. So for Catholics, this would have no bearing. We have lots of examples of Pope's writing work that is not part of their papacy, either writing things beforehand, like with Benedict XVI, or John Paul II publishing a work as a private theologian actually during his papacy. There's nothing here with the Marxist infallibility. After all, it's just a, a commentary on the uh, Book of Job, and focusing more on the spiritual life and ethics rather than uh, pulling out doctrines per se. So it really has no bearing whatsoever in terms of papal teaching. If anything, it just shows us what his thoughts may have been while he was a private theologian before his election as Pope, or perhaps even some thoughts while Pope, but again, nothing that would have any kind of uh, ecclesiastical authority whatsoever. And anybody who knows Catholic theology will affirm that. So while doing this new fresh research on Gregory the Great and reassessing my positions on him, I ran across a book that I didn't know existed, but it's written by Sir H.H. H. Haworth, simply called Gregory the Great. It's a biography. For those who are familiar with Haworth, Haworth is a Protestant author who has done a lot of study in the issues of the canon. He's done some very good work, uh, some better than others, but overall, I think he, he's one of my favorite authors. And so I searched this book, Gregory the Great, to see what he has to say, if anything, in terms of Gregory's position on the canon. And what I found was that he articulated what I was finding in my own private research very well. In fact, he puts a lot better than I can. So what I'd like to do is quote from Haworth in his work, Gregory the Great, and give an extensive quotation, because like I said, I think he really does encapsulate what I've been finding while digging through Gregory's writings. So H.H. H. Haworth says the following. As he says in the Magna Moralia, Holy Scripture is incomparably superior to every form of knowledge and science. It preaches the truth and calls us to the heavenly fatherland, etc. To him, the whole of scripture, was directly inspired by the Holy Spirit. He consequently brushed aside, as irrelevant, and, of very secondary interest, questions as to who wrote the books and when they were written. The writers, he held, were mere passive scribes. The words were those of the Holy Spirit. He, no doubt, felt much handicapped in his study of scripture by the fact that he knew neither of the languages, in which it had been originally written, Hebrew and Greek, and could only get at its contents through translations. In his time two such translations were available. One, the Old Vulgate, whose origin and date are still so obscure, but which had been the guiding star of the Latin Church from its beginning. This edition of the whole Bible was translated from the Greek which was the mother tongue of the New Testament. While in the Old Testament, which was originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic, it followed, the old Jewish-Greek translation, known as the Septuagint. Beside this was the new version, which had been made by Jerome, who followed the Hebrew and Aramaic texts in the Old Testament and the Greek in the New. The most important distinction, between the two, was not so much the considerable difference in their texts but in their canons. This especially affected the Old Testament, in which, Jerome followed the shorter canon of the later Jews, while the Old Vulgate, followed the longer canon of the older Jews, as found in the Septuagint and treated the so-called apocryphal books as canonical. While Jerome's new version had, 
at this time, especially in Gaul, largely displaced the old Vulgate. The latter still retained its hold upon Africa, and largely also upon Italy. Gregory used both versions. In the introduction to his commentary on Job, above cited, he explains his attitude in the words, quote, Now it is the new translation that I comment on. But when a case to be proved requires it, I take now the new and now the old for testimony. That is the apostolic see, over which I preside by ordinance of God, uses both, the labors of my undertaking may have the support of both. Unquote. This applies, however, only to the text. It is perfectly plain that in regard to the canon, Gregory followed that of the old version, which had been affirmed by three African councils, and, in the letter of Pope Innocent I to the Gaulish bishop Exuperius, and he habitually quotes the so-called apocryphal books, just as if they were on precisely the same level as other parts of Scripture. All right, so... As you know, here on the Apocrypha Apocalypse, we don't put a lot of weight on secondary sources. Uh, we look at primary source material and try to evaluate whether the secondary sources, how accurate they are, whether they capture it. And like I said, the reason why I quote Holworth extensively here is because my own research into primary source material confirms basically what he says. So let me expand on a couple of things that he notes. First, he noted that Gregory the Great viewed the whole of Scripture was being directly inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is something that's very clear in his writings. And when he says the whole of Scripture, he means including the Deuterocanon. Now, this is different from Jerome, because remember, Jerome believed that uh, the so-called Apocrypha, the Deuterocanon, was spurious. It was not part of the inspired original, and that's why he rejected it. So he, he would not say that the so-called Apocrypha is inspired by God. He, he might say that it's helpful, it's good for edification, but strictly speaking, it's not part of the inspired word. And this is backed up also by St. Jerome's own writings and how he uses these books. This is not the case for Gregory the Great, in which it's very clear that he sees the whole of Scripture, proto-canonical and deuterocanonical, as being directly spoken of by the Holy Spirit. And I'll give you a couple of examples when we're done here. Holworth also talks about the two different sources that were available at the time of Gregory the Great. Does a really nice summary, which modern scholars, I think, also will back up about the, the growth and expansion of the Latin Vulgate. It made big inroads into France um, and parts of Italy. However, towards the, the eastern half, uh, not so much, like North Africa and so on. Um, and so Gregory uses two different sources. He either uses the old Latin translation, which is a, a very ancient, possibly Jewish translation of the Greek Septuagint, which included the Deuterocanon within it. And therefore, there, in terms of canonicity, the old Latin would see these books as being on par, or at least no way distinguishing or qualifying these books. I think it's probably a better way to put it, as opposed to Jerome's Latin Vulgate, which was written in the fourth century, in which he explicitly rejects these books. And Gregory the Great uses both of these translations, and apparently he does so purposely, because as he says, in Rome, both of them are being used, so he's going to use both of them. So then the question is, did Gregory the Great adopt the canon of Jerome's Latin Vulgate? or did he adopt the old Latin Vulgate? And I think his last paragraph is pertinent because he says that Gregory, if you look at how he uses these books, again, throughout all his other writings, and they're substantial. Trust me, I've been going through it. It's been taking a long time. Uh, you really see no difference whatsoever between his use of the proto-canon and deuterocanon, except again for that single qualification that he gives in regards to first Maccabees. And that certainly can be connected to his awareness that Jerome had rejected these books as canonical. 
And so he's aware that his readers might do the same. So uh, Gregory's canon, if you're going by his usage, with the exception of that one qualification, very clearly lines up with the North African councils, with Pope St. Innocent's letter to uh, the bishops in Gaul, and elsewhere that these books are inspired scripture. So what we need to do is look at primary source material. Can I back this up? Now, <laughs> like I said, there's so much. I, I, I'm not going to give you all the evidence because, quite frankly, it would be super tedious and uh, it would take me a really long time because, as you know, the videos I do on this channel is long format videos. It takes a long time to do this. Just putting quotations up on the screen uh, involves some labor. So I'll give you some representative quotations and comment a little bit about them. Uh, and I think it'll show that, yeah, he didn't see any distinction between these. In fact, he sees very clearly that the Deutero canon is inspired. And uh, although this book is, you know, most of his writings is in terms of pastoral concerns, uh, so he doesn't really touch a lot on doctrine, but nevertheless, occasionally he does, and he uses the Deutero canon for it. Again, something that Jerome would never do. So here's some examples. This is from letter 18 of his Corpus of Letters. I'm not going to read all of it, but as you can see here, he quotes from the Epistle of James 4, 6, quotes from Proverbs 16, 5, quotes from Sirach 10, 9. He also quotes from Luke uh, 14, 11, Matthew 11, 29. And again, he quotes from Sirach 6, 6, and then finally from 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Notice all of these quotations are given. There is no qualification or distinction made between the books. They're all perfectly seamless. Next, we have on pastoral care in 320, he has a series of quotations. And notice how many times these quotations are formally made. In other words, they have a formal introduction. Uh, again, uh, no qualification or distinction is made between them. So he says, let them listen to the scriptures. And then he quotes from Proverbs 3.28. Again, less under the guise of liberality, they scatter uselessly what they have. Let them hear what is written. Again, formal quotations, Sirach 12.1. And again, they may give little uh, when it is necessary. Let them hear what is written. And then he continues, and let them heed what the scripture says. Again, Sirach 12, 5 through 6. And again, and that last quote, by the way, is from the book of Tobit. So notice here a string of formal citations. These are formal introductions, usually reserved for the quotation of scripture. And indeed, he uses it for both the proto-canonical books and the deuterocanonical books, making no distinction or qualification whatsoever. The use of the formal introductions for the deuterocanonical books are so numerous that even to just list all the references would be too laborious for a video. But again, we could keep going. In his Moralia and Job 4 and its preface, Scripture witnesses where it says, and then he quotes from Wisdom 6.6 6 and Luke 12.48. In Moralia 9.59, it says, And the sons of perdition in their persecutions say concerning the same Redeemer, and he is clean contrary to our doings, Wisdom 2.12. And soon afterwards, for his life is not like other men's. That's also from Wisdom. Uh, verse 15. What's interesting here is notice that he sees wisdom too as a prophecy about Jesus, that this is speaking about the Redeemer. And we've already done a few videos on wisdom too in relationship to Matthew 27 43. And you can check that out here. But this is just one of several fathers who understood this to be a prophecy about Jesus. And again, if this is human writings, incapable of confirming doctrine, they're not written by the Holy Spirit, 
it's weird that Gregory the Great would think that it would include a prophecy about Jesus. Here's another interesting thing. This is Melia and Job 2.12. He makes a string of references. Again, no qualification or distinction between proto-canonical and deuterocanonical references. And notice the introductions he uses here. He says, once it is written concerning his spirit, for the spirit of the Lord filleth the world, wisdom 1.7. Okay, so here he believes that the Book of Wisdom is disclosing true revelation about the Holy Spirit. And notice he has the formal introduction, it is written. And then the next quote, Whence it is that his wisdom saith, I alone can pass the circuit of heaven. This is from Sirach 24.6. Now notice his wisdom saith. That seems to be yet another instance of where the Holy Spirit is speaking through due to a canonical book. Although I'm willing to say that's somewhat dubious. You might push against that, but nevertheless, it seems to be pointing in that direction. And then he continues on and he says, hence, it is that the Lord says again, notice that, says again, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, quoting from Isaiah 66, 1. And again, it is written of him, he meteth out heaven with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth with a measure, again, from Isaiah 40, 12. This seems to me, especially if you take all these quotes together, that he's investing the deuterocanonical books, just like the protocanonical books, with divine authorship. So how can a book be divinely authored and not canonical? Very interesting question. In the very same work, again, this is Morelia in Job, the same book that had that qualification. It says in 1149, the sacred writ woman is taken either of the sex or else for frailty for the sex as it is written God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, Galatians 4.4. 4. But for frailty, as were it is said by the wise man, better the iniquity of a man than a woman's doing well, Sirach 42.14. What I find interesting here is first, he's deducing two things from scripture. One has to do with sex. The other one has to do with frailty. And notice that each half of that equation is nailed down with books, Galatians 4.4 4 for one and Sirach 42.14 for the other. So they both make up two aspects of what he's quoting in regards to the subject from sacred writ. So again, you don't see any qualification nor distinction. Both are held up apparently as equal, just much like Haworth says. In the same work, 1812, says this, For be it far from us in this place to interpret a parable, that musical instrument, since neither is allowed to suppose that under infliction of chastisings, he used music. When the truth saith by his scripture, music in mourning is a tale out of season, quoting from Sirach 22. Six. Now, here is something very interesting. Over and over again, if you look at Gregory's works, he always quotes Sirach, or almost always quotes Sirach, as the wise man. He almost always quotes Ecclesiastes as from Solomon. He almost always quotes Jesus's words as the truth saith, or something like that. So when he says, when the truth saith, He's talking about Jesus, okay, the Son. Now, put this together. When he says, when the truth says by his scripture, he is saying that the Son is speaking in the scriptures, and specifically, the Son is speaking in the book of Sirach. Very, very interesting. Again, if this is just edifying literature, and it's not inspired, and it has no weight, how in the world can you put those two together?
is beyond me. In Morelia 3145, for the root, for pride is the root of all evil, of which it is said, as scripture bears witness, pride is the beginning of all sin, Sirach 10.1. Here he's adducing Sirach as a witness from scripture. Very interesting. Okay, the next passage I think is very fascinating because it centers in on doctrine. And this comes from Gregory the Great's homilies on Ezekiel. Now, to my knowledge, this uh, work has never been translated into English. All we have is the Latin. And uh, this is from homilies of Ezekiel, book one, homily five, paragraph nine. It can be found in the Ming Patrologia Latinae, volume 76, page 824. And I give you my own English translation of the Latin. So you have the Latin here, you have the English. And uh, although I'm sure my English translation is not perfect, nevertheless, I think it will give you at least a good idea of what he's saying here. And what's interesting here is he's focusing in on doctrine. And he's also focusing on a very important chapter in the Book of Wisdom, which is chapter seven. So let's read what Gregory has to say. He says, quote, but since the Holy Spirit is God before the ages and co-eternal with the Father and the Son, we must ask ourselves why he is said to run around. For everyone who runs around approaches to the place where he is not and leaves him in which he was. For what reason, then, can we say that the Spirit is dispersed while all things are within it, and there is nowhere where there is not. As it is written, the Spirit of the Lord has filled the world, wisdom 1.7. And yet, when the praise of wisdom is described, it is attached. It is, for in it, there is a spirit of understanding, a spirit that is unique, manifold, subtle and movable wisdom 722 and shortly after gentle steady wisdom 723 in these spring a great question again rises for us why that spirit is said to be the one who fills all things together and is stable but if we have recourse to the use of human custom we must find the sense of the speaker more quickly. So here he's talking about the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit. And he says that the Spirit fills all things. So it's there's no place where the Spirit is not. And yet it also describes the Spirit as being mobile, that and which implies that he's moving from place to place. So how is it that the Holy Spirit can be uh, everywhere and yet said to be mobile. And notice here he is exegeting from wisdom. Well, he starts off with 1 7, which is one of his favorite proof texts for, and other early church fathers too, by the way. If you've watched this channel, you know this wisdom 1 7 for the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit. But then he goes into wisdom 7 and the names that wisdom is given the titles, the qualities that the wisdom of God has given. Now, many of you may be familiar with this because in the previous uh, episodes, we've looked at the impact of Wisdom 7 on Trinitarian discussions and how the early church fathers repeatedly go to Wisdom 7, especially 726, to hammer out the co-eternality of the Son with the Father. And here we have Gregory, I think, following in that same tradition, and again, appealing to the Book of Wisdom, and specifically Wisdom 7. In this regard, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, this goes way beyond anything Jerome would allow, because obviously he's confirming doctrine using a deuterocanonical book which Jerome expressly rejected. Now, so far we've seen Tobit, 
we've seen uh, Sirach and Wisdom be quoted. He also uses deuterocanonical Daniel and also uh, the book of Baruch. Uh, for example, in his exposition on the books of Kings, book one, chapter 215, uh, this is available only in Latin. There's no English translation that I could find. So this is my own English translation. Um, it says this, quote, And as for the type of Jerusalem chosen by the soul, it is said by the prophet, stand on high, see the pleasure that will come to you from your God. Quoting from Baruch 4.36. So he sees Baruch as the work of the prophet. Again, Jerome is very clear in his prefaces that Baruch is not part of scripture. It's apocryphal. So we have Gregory the Great calling Baruch a prophet. We have Jerome saying it's not a prophet. It's not even canonical. We have in uh, the same expositions on the books of Kings, book 221. And again, this is only available in Latin. The best I can make out in English is this. Whence also Solomon, saddened at the loss of the temporal goods of the world, says to the rich man, quote, the sluggard must be stoned from the dung of the oxen, Sirach 22.2, as if to say, and then he continues, and then he quotes Paul. Now, if my translation is correct, and again, I could stand corrected on this, so if I did, may I call upon in advance, but as far as I can tell in the Latin, it seems as if Gregory the Great includes Sirach as part of the works of Solomon. Again, that's something that's explicitly rejected by St. Jerome. There, we could go on and on with very similar things. Every instance that I give here can be multiplied, except for perhaps that uh, one reference to uh, Sirach being part of Solomon. I think that might be the only time in his works that at least I was able to find where he includes it amongst the books of Solomon. But nevertheless, I think this pretty much affirms what Howard says in that passage that we quoted from, that Gregory the Great used uh, the Old Latin, he used Jerome's Vulgate, he tried to use both of them in the work because at that time in Italy, uh, the Vulgate and the Old Latin was more or less equal or in other parts, Jerome was slowly starting to overtake the old Latin. He anticipates that those who read the Latin may read Jerome's prefaces in the books of Solomon and may object to him using 1 Maccabees. But just like Howard said, if you look at how he uses it, everywhere else, and like I said, there are so many quotations that we could look at, um, it's very clear that he makes absolutely no distinction between the Deutero and canon, uh, proto-canonical books outside of that one qualification. And the very clearly, at least in those instances that I showed you, I think suggests that God is speaking through these books, the Deutero-canonical books, which is something that no Protestant today would ever affirm. And of course, that leads to the conclusion that, like Holworth concluded, that he followed the larger canon of the old Latin rather than Jerome's new shorter canon, because after all, Jerome would never affirm these things or say these things about these books. I, I think it goes way beyond what he understood in Hebrew verite. And so Gregory the Great, I suppose you could use it as part of your list of people who rejected these books, but it really isn't a slam dunk argument for a Gregory Great, and it certainly has absolutely no bearing in terms of official Catholic teaching. Coming from a Catholic, and if you know anybody who is competent in matters of Catholic theology, uh, they, they would immediately say, yeah, this is really of no consequence in terms of dogmatic teaching of the church. So I hope you found this interesting. I hope I didn't put too much detail up there to make this real tedious. But nevertheless, I think perhaps this puts Gregory the Great's witness in perspective. Hopefully it did. So if you enjoyed this video or you enjoy the videos on this channel, I highly encourage you, please subscribe and like.
uh, help us boost our algorithm so other people can discover this channel and also have access to this information. If you feel moved to support William Albrecht and myself, we both are on Patreon and we appreciate that because it enables us to buy resources to do research like this. So we appreciate your support. Till next time, I'm Gary Machuda. Bye-bye.